my mother said, is what you're doing right now, your deepest aspiration in life, is this really your heart's desire? And I said, no. And she said, don't forget that. All right, well, welcome back to the Funky Brain Podcast, everybody. My name is Dennis, and this is my funky brain. And I am super excited, honored, and privileged today to have an entertainment legend, a talk show host a, with a career spanning five decades, nearly, nearly five decades, and a four-time Emmy Award winner, Mr. Bill Boggs. How are you doing today, sir? Well, how can you be doing? You know, trapped at home like everybody else. Worried, like everybody else, uh, taking it literally now is the only time there is, one day at a time, like everybody else, uh, being as careful as, as I can be. You know, I do go out shopping. I wore a mask yesterday for the first time. Now, actually, the first time I ever had one of the masks on, I didn't, we didn't have any masks, so... I tried to get masks. I went to the store, they didn't have masks. I couldn't order masks. I said, how can I get a mask? I said, ah, I'll get my teeth cleaned and I'll demand that the dentist give me a mask. So I went to the dentist. It cost me $120, you know, grinding away. Again, my, at the end of the thing, I said, can I have a mask? No. I said, please, I need a mask. Said, okay. So she's got this pile of masks about this high. He takes one mask off. Now, I paid $120 to get my teeth cleaned. And hands, I said, can I have two? So she gave me a mask, right? So yesterday, for the first time, I employed the mask, drive to the market, get out of my car, put the mask on, right, into the market. And as I'm walking around, I'm feeling this kind of strange feeling, but it's a familiar, happy feeling. Where, is, where did I feel like this before? Buying my things, very careful. All of a sudden, I found myself doing something I haven't done. I'm like staring with the mask on at the candies. And I'm thinking, Halloween. It's the first time I've worn a mask since I was like eight years old on Halloween. But I resisted. I resisted buying myself my all-time favorite candy, Three Musketeers. So... That's what life is like these days. You know, everything is completely different. On yeah, and off. one of the reasons I'm super excited to have you on is because it is it's a challenging time for everybody right now. Yeah. It's unprecedented. We don't know what they're doing. People are being hit in so many different ways. Like, you know, obviously financially is the big one. Obviously health, that's, uh, that's probably bigger. And, uh, but emotionally in so many different ways. And it's kind of a tough time. So I wanted to have you on to bring light. And that's why I'm excited that you're here today because, you know, we need to bring light into the situation, light into the darkness, right? You can't yeah. kill. The and laughter it's, is best medicine, in my opinion. Like, absolutely. Have that personal insight into keeping yourself as calm as possible. Uh, you know, I was at a drugstore last night getting a few things. And for some reason, honestly, Dennis, I just started to have anxiety about the people around me, the stuff on the shelves. And we, Jane and I walked back home and I thought, wow, that really felt strange. So we have to do our best to control these things. One of the mechanisms that I, I mentioned this the other day when we were talking, that I use to control myself is the recognition that most fear is imagined outcomes, imagined outcomes. Mark Twain, by the way, whom I never interviewed, <laughs> I know I've had a long career. I've never got to mark them. Mark Twain said, I've been through some terrible things in my life, and some of them actually happened. So, uh, although horrible things are happening now and will continue to happen for a long time, it's important to recognize now is the only time there is. Be here now, Ram Das. By the way, Ram Das, if you're familiar with that great book, Be Here Now, there's an interview I did with Ram Das back in 78 on my YouTube channel, Bill Box TV. I have 476 clips from various shows on Bill Box TV on YouTube. This is a free channel. I'm not plugging this to make money. But people are looking for diversions 
that is a good diversion. But anyway, now is the only time there is. And that, com- that can be very comforting if you continue to do that. Now is the only time there is. I agree with you. Yeah, living in the present. And when you, what I, one of the things I was taught is that if you think about all the things that you um, stressed over and feared over, how many of them actually came true? Imagined outcomes, Dennis. In this case, we're all imagining we're going to die. And then you have to offset that. I'll turn to Jane, my beloved Jane, my, my mate, my companion, girlfriend. We lived together, we've been together almost 10 years. And, and she just says, we're going to be okay. We're not going to die. Okay, I believe you, that helps. So but think of the people who are alone, who don't have a beloved mate. You know, you have to reach out to everybody you know, everyone you know. I agree with you, yeah. And, you know, we need that contact. And I would say that one of the things that is really great is about the time that we're living in right now, because look at this. Like, we can't hug people, but you're 2,000 miles away from me right now, and we're looking each other in the eye. We're getting that human interaction that we need, and for now, that's pretty good. It really is good. I mean, the stuff we're doing now is at home. We're just, our behavior is totally different. I almost cut off my ear trying to cut my hair this morning. I don't know, I better, ah, Jesus, the scissors. So we got to be careful too. You need to be careful, Bill. Please be careful. So last week, you had an exciting event happen. There was a release of your book. No, actually, um, the book is now available for advanced sale. And when I, it'd, be, it'd be fun to talk about the book. There's a lot of creativity and, and release in that. I'm going to show you what the book is. This is the, the world's smallest <laughs> promo. That is the book. <laughs> the event, it, it, it's, it's not the actual book. I mean, it's not like the world's, like one of those tiny little Bibles they used to sell. But it's called The Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog as told to Bill Boggs and look, there's a little politically incorrect humor warning on the cover. And this uh, is available right now at orderspike.com. It's published by Post Hill Press. And it will actually be, I, you know, this actually works. The first time I ever did this. On talk shows over the years, I, my arms would fly up into this position of holding books and plugging books. And now I'm doing it on a computer with one the size of a postage stamp. But that's the book. <laughs> And let's talk about it. Yes, please. Let's talk about it. So it's about a canine, the Spike the Wonder Dog, as told to you, two big right. dogs from Spike. You're talking, you're talking funky brain. I've had a dog talking to me for four years. What I, when my last television, pro, very quickly, when my last television project went off the air, which was a show called My Generation for uh, ARP, where I interviewed successful people about their success. Um, I decided that I wasn't going to chase yet another TV job, that I would focus on writing. I, have the, I began my career writing. I began my career comedy producing. I've written two other books, a novel that was actually optioned for a movie at first sight, uh, actually optioned by Renee Zellweger. It didn't get made into a movie, but she liked it. And um, a self-help book, which you can talk about later, got what it takes. So the idea that I had was, before I went to New York for my big break, doing a show called Midday Live, I had a show in North Carolina called Southern Exposure with Bill Box. And as fate would have it, this little dog I had was, was a puppy, an English Bull Terrier with a little spot on his eye, was on the show one day, and he yawns like <laughs> into the camera. People loved it. And so we called him Spike the Wonder Dog, and he became a big hit down there. But he got killed. He got run over by a car before, just before I went to New York. So the premise I thought was, what if Spike hadn't gotten killed and he had come with me to New York and became, in today's world, a huge internet and TV star? So the story of the book is about a dog who comes to New York, becomes a huge star, and the price of fame for both the dog and his talk show host, Master. And as soon as, from anybody out there who's a writer or is interested in writing, as soon as I sat down at this very computer, which, on which I'm talking to you, just to get the idea for the book going, the voice of the dog came to me. A voice I had never written in or spoken in, 
flowed through me. And so for the two and a half years it took to write it, I had that dog connected in my head. The dog's a pretty irreverent character. I think he likes you, though. You yeah, he does. He thinks you're a cool guy. <laughs> <laughs> does he have funky brain, too? Spike, the wonder dog, is like, he's sort of like George Carlin in a dog suit or Jerry Seinfeld in a dog suit. He's observing the foibles of humanity. And a lot, a, lot of, a lot of interesting things. This book has gotten reviews like Wall Street Journal said, one of the funniest books I've ever read. The author of Forrest Gump read, read it and said, uh, comedic wizardry. So I'm not bragging. I'm just saying we've already gotten some good reviews. At a time, this, it's like the essential kind of book we, we need right now is something that make us laugh, something that's fun. And that's why, one more time, The Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog has told to Bill Boggs. Available now. Just go to orderspike.com. Go to Amazon right now. And you can order it. You can pre-order it. It will be released formally on May 19th. But you can get it now. It will be, you'll be getting it. I'm That's curious, because I, I have to ask, since you brought it up, and it is posted in those different places where you're talking about, that it's politically incorrect, and it's on the cover. Like, oh, yeah, right. what inspired the politically incorrectness? Is it because of the current state of the world? Because of the what, excuse me? The current state of the world, or the nation. Exactly. Although, I think that we li we're living in a time of, well, no, let me, let me put this another way, Dennis. Prior to the virus, we were living in a time. I don't know what effect the virus will have on what I'm about to say. We're living in a time of uh, hyper sensitivity. This offends that person. This offends that person. You wrote this on Facebook. You're wrong. I don't like that. All this, right? You're making fun of that person. Why are you making this anger and sensitivity, I'm not really honestly sure how it evolved that way, why colleges have trigger warnings that students could get upset about something in, uh, that, that Ernest Hemingway wrote and would need a place to go to because they're physically upset by it. How this sense sensitivity evolved, I don't know, but it existed. And so as I was writing the book, I thought, ooh, Somebody's that's going to offend somebody. And then maybe like the middle of the book, I thought, I wonder if they're going to like the characterization or one of the, they'll think this is uh, too much objectification of women. There's this one huge scene in the book where uh, they're in Las Vegas. And this is like, this is absurdist humor. And they go to this, the world's first topless theme park. You know, in other words, it's like a scores or a gentleman's club, except it's a water park at the same time. And there's all kinds of crazy stuff there. Will this be, the woman who runs the place is called, is named Mindy Mounds, but it's a totally female run enterprise. And their motto is, we'll profit from toxic masculinity to infinity. <laughs> so within three pages, I can offend men who don't want to be offended because of toxic masculinity. I can offend women who think I'm objectifying women, which I am, because, hey, we all look writing about it. So I just thought, you know, screw it. I'll put a warning on the cover. And if you read the book and you get pissed off, you've been warned. That's it. That's it. No, I agree with you. And, you know, I think that one of the reasons – that this is happening, and this is a, like a philosophical type reason. And, uh, you know, I don't you, you understand it. If it's philosophical, you know, it's over my head. Yeah, right. yeah. But, you know, I think that the world, you were just kind of talking about it, but the world got really big, really fast, really uh, technical, really uh, advanced, really busy, full of fear, insecurity, and entitlement. And I think that all of this happening, well, one, it's very serious, but I think it's God's way, whatever God is, of slowing us down, saying, hey, we need to re regroup our brains, and we need to reorganize and get back on track of what this is all about. And I don't know what it's all about, but I think hopefully there are lessons learned that we don't yet know and that we carry them through, like to learn to love each other again and to take care of each other. That's you're what good, I think. You're a good man, Dennis. Let me tell you something. When you're lying there in a gurney, 
in the hospital hallway, hoping to get inside for a ventilator, red and blue makes no difference. You know, that's right. We could theoretically, whenever the other side of this is, we could theoretically come out here a much more united country, a much more united people. They were always going to be the fringe of one side or the other. In recent, in recent years, the fringe moving in. But anyway, this is all, and you know, honestly, truthfully, Dennis, we're talking about the past. We're in a new form of life right now. Yeah, I agree with you. That, that's really awesome. So, you know, smear an off here just a second. Oh, yeah. No, no, well, it's morning. You got to get on. Well, actually, where you are, it's just afternoon. So I would say you're right on track. Go for it. Listen, man, you're good. You've been clean and sober for how long? Uh, next week, April 8th, will be 17 years. Tell me what happened <clears throat> April 7th. So actually, I can go back 10 days but prior to that. On March 27th, which is a big day in my life, I got fired from my job, which was kind of a big deal to me at the time. In the whole scheme of my life, not a huge deal, but it was, I was like proud of that job. And it was alcohol and drug related. And um, I couldn't stop drinking. And so I got fired. I lost my job and it hit me hard. And they gave me some back pay, some severance and stuff. And so I went on a bender just trying to like kill myself with drugs and alcohol. And I, you know, the problem was, Bill, every morning I kept waking up. That's what it was. It was like, I, I can't explain to you why I, I, I ended up in that place where I did from like going back years and years. But on April 8th, I went, on the, I went on this bender for about 10 days. And on April 8th, I woke up in the morning and I had a girl who was with me at the time who was really nice. And uh, she was yeah, really she had to be nice. To be honest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I was gross. I was a mess. And, you know, I, I was 60 pounds heavier than I am now. I'm not who you see is not who I used to be. But she woke up or she came into my apartment and she just looked at me and she goes, you know, this can't work. And I just started crying. I said, I can't stop. And she got on the internet, which was that dial up internet at the time. And uh, she got me, helped get me, she was instrumental in getting me into a, uh, a treatment facility. And I was there for 30 days. And that was, that was April 8th, 2003. When you came out of the treatment facility, what did you hold on to that stopped you from having that first drink or the first puff or the first whatever pill or whatever it was, all three probably? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. I, I think, you know, when people talk about sobriety or whatever your, your problem is, change usually happens at rock bottom. That's where people talk about that rock bottom or when you, you just can't take it anymore. And I really believe I was at the end of my rope financially, health, mental health, physical health. And I didn't know how to change that. And so I think when, in my book that I wrote, it's called Funky Wisdom, A Practical Guide to Life. And what I have in there are the, these principles. And people say, how do I get sober? How do I change my life? How do I have successful relationships? How do I become healthy? And the answer is in how. H-O-W, I honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. So I had to be honest, and I said, uh, my life is falling apart. I'm dying physically, emotionally, spiritually, and I had to be open to seeing a new way of living. I had to be willing to do those things to change my life. And when, you, when you're honest, open, and willing, you could do anything. I believe that. And so hopefully... I, that was my last drink. And as of today, it is. Well, congratulations on that. I mean, you've helped a lot of people. Your book, which is very, which I'm waiting to come in, uh, I'm sure has helped a lot of people. Uh, I think that, you know, in the situation we're in now, we probably have more addiction occurring because of uh, unemployment, because of everything. You know, it's interesting I don't like, this argument really should not be, at this point, politicized. Things could have been done differently. Why, you know, come on television. Why don't we have a solution? This is complicated, you know. If, if all of a sudden you have 10% unemployment, you don't just go into a room and in a half hour figure out 
how you're going to solve that, no matter who you are. But we have to have faith that uh, we have to have faith that the government we have is going is going to help us because uh, state government, local governments. I, I happen to be in Palm Beach, and Palm Beach went above the governor's orders and ordered stay at home, <clears throat> closed restaurants and all kinds of things two weeks ago. Set up a curfew, which was good, very good. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, again, it's an unprecedented time, um, I will say, to make light of the situation, which is what we're supposed to be doing here today. Well, let's, let's move in that direction. Yeah, let's well, do. it's funny because you said I'm in Palm Beach, and I was like, I went out this morning for my walk, which I do every morning and every night, and I am not in Palm Beach. I'm in Colorado in the Rocky Mountains, and it's cold. And I wore my – because in the basement, I have a, a, a bike trainer, and so I was riding my bike, and I had my bike shorts on. So I just said, okay, yesterday was nice in the 60s. So I went out in my shorts. Only this morning, it was in the high 20s. And uh, when I came home, I had snow on the hair on my legs. It was really cold. So I wish I was in Palm Beach with you right now. I wish you were. Uh, well, one of the things that we're doing, if you want to talk about lightening the load, all right. Every Friday at 5 o'clock, I'm returning to live television. Uh, with an interview show called Ready? Trapped Live with Bill Boggs. And I'm going to have each week a funny person. Uh, uh, Friday, this past Friday's guest, we had Tom Cotter. I don't, I don't know who we're having that next Friday, this coming Friday. I'll let you know. And um, you know, it's, 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 it, 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 it's possible. It's possible. I need to look at your comedy chops. I'm hoping for Lucy Arnaz. Uh, and um, Alec Baldwin coming up. Uh, but I haven't, done, I haven't done much advanced booking. But what I'd like to say is this. If you're looking for a diversion, again, this is not a commercial plug because I don't make a dime. I've spent thousands of dollars to put this stuff up. Bill Boggs TV, YouTube. Go to the channel, subscribe, and roam over it. Like, for example, last week, one of the great, jazz guitarist of all time, Bucky Pizzarelli, died. He was in the Tonight Show band. His son, John Pizzarelli, is a singer-guitarist. His, his other son, Martin, is a brilliant bassist. Uh, uh, and the third generation are musicians. On that YouTube channel, you can see Bucky Pizzarelli playing with bass great Milt Hinton all the way back in 1979. There are iconic figures. Yul Brenner, Jerry Lewis, Sammy Davis Jr., Frank Sinatra, Natalie Wood, Sean Connery, uh, it, Itzhak Perlman. Gore Vidal. I'm going. Hmm? Gore Vidal. Gore Vidal debating with Roy Cohen. There's 476 classic moments of television there. Some more classic than others, hosted by me, but in various stages of awakeness. So. <laughs> I urge people to do that, and, and I urge them to order The Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog as told to Bill Boggs, right? I didn't write the book. The dog told me the story. So what does that mean in various stages of awakenness? Pardon me? You just said in various stages of awakenness? What does that mean? I'm joking about myself. I try, every day, I try to find some way to like put myself down in a funny way that I'm hosting the show in various stages of awakeness. That's all. <laughs> but actually, there's truth. In all these little put-downs, there's an element of truth. I mean, I live through, I guess if I live through the Studio 54 days in, in Manhattan, I can live through this. You know? <laughs> I also would say my father, as a 12-year-old, lived through the Spanish flu epidemic. My mother, as a 2-year-old, lived through and her brothers and older brother, they lived through the Spanish flu epidemic, which was terrible in Philadelphia. I mean, Philadelphia is one of the worst mortality rates because they didn't take precautions. So I'm saying to myself, if they did it, I'm, I'll do it. But that's, that's what's on our mind these days. Laughter is the best medicine, other than you know, washing your hands. I imagine that the American Nose Pickers Association is really, they're getting very few hits to their website these days. Keep your hands out, away, no plunging your fingers in your eyes, your nose, your mouth. Remember that. You can have the virus on your hand. I know. Yeah. Wash your hands. 
you're just making light of yourself and you have to be able to laugh at yourself because, um, you know, otherwise we're just being too sensitive. And I'm an easy target, but I'm an easy target for laughing at myself. I'm like nuts. Yeah. You talk about, yeah, yeah, absolutely. My motto is I never said I wasn't crazy. Right. Well, <laughs> you're doing well. Um, so in the, so we're the, one of the cool things, which we kind of just talked about is that we're 2000 miles apart and we're still having this, this intimate talk here as if we were on like the same set together. And so in this world of technology, we have the streaming TVs, the YouTube, the podcast, the all different kinds of mediums. Like, and with somebody coming from your background with your rich history, what do you love about it? And what do you not like about it? Do you see any, do you see negativity in it? Uh, actually, no. Um, you know what I see in terms of performances by comedians and so forth and everyone and even this situation even right now more authenticity than when there's a studio audience or you're in a set and the cameras are on you more of an authentic conversation with a little bit depending on who you are what it is various levels of decreased performance you know I've seen w women and men, many people these days, in the old days, before the crisis probably still exists, are, are like in a performance mode of their technology. They're seeing reality shows where people are, oh, God, oh, my God. <laughs> They're going like this. Every guest on the Ellen DeGeneres show doesn't just walk on. They come on with like this. This is like not normal behavior. If you walk in a room and there's people there, Normally, you would say, hi, how are you doing? But the trend has been, whoa, whoa, well, shuck and jive, and here I am, oh, hi, and all that. If you look at commercials and stuff, there's that extra thing. More authenticity. You know, what I look for, for example, you know who I love on television? Nora O'Donnell, the anchor of the CBS News. This woman is performing and authentic at totally the same time. You can see the emotions in her eyes, her smile is a natural smile. Her concern look is a natural concern look. In the book, Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog, I somehow, I, I get into talking about, um, let's see, anchors, local anchors on television who earn, earn a million dollars a year by their, with part of their ability to look concerned. Look concerned. For example, the female, the female reporter is talking about a stabbing in the Bronx while the male reporter is nodding solemnly in the camera while thinking, stabbing, where am I going to go for dinner tonight? Stabbing, knives, ah, sushi. That's yeah. what he's thinking about, but he's, can't you see that look, you know? So I'm, the thing I'm always looking for or have been more than ever before is authenticity in people. Yeah, and no, I love that. That's one no, of the reasons. No bullshit. No extra trimmings. This is who I am. This is the way it is. And we're getting more of that now and less of the other. That's a long answer to a very good question. No, Thanks. I love that. I think that one of the things I love about podcasting is that, well, one, it's not rehearsed. People having conversations. And I think people crave that, kind of like you just said. It's like, one, if you're on that other show, it's rehearsed. It's scripted. And if you want to watch that, watch a movie. And I think people are craving authenticity, like hearing like how people live, how, not how Tom Cruise lives, but how do normal people live and think? And they want to connect with that. And I think that podcasting is great because it gives us an opportunity to take somebody like you who's been around for decades on a celebrity level and see that you're just a normal dude. And I love that. Well, that, that we get to have this conversation. Yeah. It's just this normal. I don't know. Jane, Jane, I'm Bill Boggs. Jane, do you think I'm just a normal dude? I'm a simple soul, right? That's my girlfriend. I keep saying, I'm a simple soul. You're never boring. That, that's the highest compliment. After almost 10 years, you just heard it. You're never boring, Bill. Bill Boggs is never boring. I don't know about that. Some, I actually don't. In truth, in my life, I've been vo bored rarely. When I was in basic training in the Army, that was sometimes boring. 
It's just, you know, it's waiting in line for food, blah, blah, blah. It's boring. But as I look back on it, that the eight months of basic training, I'm glad I did it. You know, you can hardly wait to get out, but I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I did it. You know, um, one thing you said to me, when, when we spoke last week, the one thing you said to me that, that I love more than anything, and this is, I think, everybody's dream in life. You said, I've accomplished all I ever could have imagined in my life. Well, no. What I actually said was that I'm one of those lucky people who made his childhood dream come true. Because for whatever reason, my mother t told me when I was four years old that I was walking around the house with a pencil, pretending it was a microphone interviewing people because even that far back, I wanted to be like the men on the radio and the television interviewing people. So I made that dream come true. And it wasn't like a, a through line, I'm four years old and I'm going to make this dream come true. But it turned out, when push came to shove, and I got out of graduate school, and I was in a job as, as a writer, which was really boring. When push came to shove, it came to the surface. And I got out of that job and got into show business with a comedy team, working producing with them and managing them. And I was in show business and got myself on television a few years later. So that childhood dream was never forgotten, you know. The best one of, one of the best things anyone has ever said to me was three years into a really happy and successful time launching the comedy team of Patchett and Tarsus. So m many people would not remember their names, but in the late 60s, they were a comedy team. They were on all the, the shows as a stand-up comedy team, which really doesn't exist anymore in show business, like Abbott Costello and Martin and Lewis, Rowan and Martin. Stiller and Mira, Mike Nichols, Elaine May. You had Patch and Tarsus. Um, and so for three years, they were performing. They were great writers. They ended up stopping writing and being the head writers for Bob Newhart and Mary Tyler Moore. They, this was big. And they wrote ALF and Muppet movies and stuff like that. But after three years of and great success, my mother said to me at Thanksgiving, are you happy doing what you're doing, managing a comedy team. I said, yeah, we're going to California, we're doing this. She said, but I thought you always wanted to have your own show, that you wanted to be the lead, the star. I said, yeah. My mother said, is what you're doing right now your deepest aspiration in life? Is this really your heart's desire? And I said, no. And she said, don't forget that. Three weeks later, I got the opportunity to work on a television show, had an amicable parting with the comedy team, and that's how I, my mother, is this your deepest aspiration, your heart's desire? No, don't forget that. That's, that's essentially the um, inciting influence that made it happen at that point. I love that. Yeah, so many people get stuck in in the job because it's what they're supposed to do. You know, well, they have to do it. Let's face it. They have to. We took a, a big risk, excuse me for interrupting, but at age 26, you know, I had a, an apartment that I had a car payment. So it took us a, a, a leap of faith to quit a job with health benefits and everything else to manage a comedy team and go home and live with my parents. But that alternative for me at that age, be harder to do if you're a wife and a child, was far better than showing up at 8.15 every morning and writing about gaskets and ceiling tiles and floor wax. Nothing's wrong with those products, but they, they didn't really turn me on. I can't explain. I never got really into the Armstrong World Products Company where we were working, where Tom and Jay and I, three of us were working there. Yeah, these are... Such awesome stories. I'm like, I'm awe inspired. But I think that what you said was like you were, um, you were not happy in what you were doing and you have to go after it. And you, you took a risk. And a lot of people aren't willing to take that risk because they don't want to fail. Well, I'll give you, I'll give you a point. And I'm not, this book came out 10 years ago. But I wrote this book, got what it's, this actual book, 
got what it takes. Successful people reveal how they made it to the top. And it has Joe Torrey, Craig Newmark. Uh, it's got Matt Lauer. You can't even mention his name anymore. It has Bill <laughs> O'Reilly, the same thing there. It has Diane von Furstenberg, Sir Richard Branson, Bobby Flay, uh, Frederick Fakai, and many, many more. And one of the subjects in the book who is a, a specialist and a risk management, uh, studying risk, simply, I'll get right to it. She said, if you're risk averse, you can be successful, but you'll probably never be wildly successful because there's a set of coping skills that come with taking a risk and failing that leads to greater success. So yeah, if you're privileged enough that you can take the risk. And there are people who take that risk with the family uh, and they'll, they'll go forward in life. But I was able to take the risk. I was not risk adverse at, in the least bit at age, whatever I was, 25, 26. That's the time to go for it. Yeah, I agree with you. I, but I also think because, of, <clears throat> because I'm similar to you, I'm more of a risk taker. And I'm willing to, get, I'm willing to take the risk and to fail and to pay the price, which I have. I've paid the price. Wow. I've had massive success, and I've had massive failure. I've had both, but I was willing to take that risk. And so I preach a lot, and I think a lot of people do about, you have to go take the risk. You have to take that chance and do your dreams. And I think that that's true on some level, but I think, there's a, I think that I, we should also mention that there are people that are not cut out for it, that aren't willing to take the rest and they don't want to, they want the security, the paycheck, the insurance. They want to know like how each week is going to go. And we need that. We need those people too. And that, that's, that's just what I was thinking. I, I just want to remind people that too. It's like, I always talk about go after your dreams and goals. And if, and if you feel like if you're waking up in the middle of the night and you feel unfulfilled and unhappy and, you're, and stuck, then yes, you need to go after it. But if you feel comfortable, then, then you keep being you. Two things. Everything you're saying, I agree with. However, now the reality, just take that whole conversation, and it's like you have 100-mile-an-hour hurricane winds blowing against you as you may be trying to take that risk. Therefore, I would say in this new environment that we live in and may be living in for a long, protracted long period of time, ways of taking risk may be different. There may be whole ways of starting new businesses, seeing, you know, in difficult times, the astute discern opportunity is another quote from that book. Um, or a risk might be if you have any medical training going out and risking, literally physically risking your life. But when we're talking about... What risks are now are much different than they were two months ago, you know. And the whole, the whole dynamic of self-help is different than it was. Believe me, my predictions don't always come true. We're going to emerge from this with a significantly different society, a significantly different way of communicating, a significantly different way of entertaining, a significant different way of working, of earning money. And I think there'll be, we may not shake hands anymore. You know, that, that, that would not be the worst thing in the world, you know, shaking hands. Um, I like the greeting, hi, like that. That's a universal sign of acceptance. Did you know that? Yeah. No. Yes. So, uh, it, it is, you, anywhere in the world, if someone comes up to you and you go like that, it's a peace. It's like showing your palms, peace. This is a nice one, too. But that's a minor point compared to what we've got to face. Yeah, I'm a hugger. Like, I always went around for years. I'm like, hey, how's it going? And it was like uh, the, the hug, the brotherly love, the, like the, the friendly love, spreading the love. And now we're going to have to have new ways of greeting. Virtual hugs. But, you know, I can hardly wait till we get to that point and figure out it's okay, you know. Yeah. We've got a long battle ahead of us, Dennis. We really do. I, I was out walking this morning, like I already talked about, but I have to, like, if you see somebody coming, it's like yeah. everybody's walking around each other. And I think right now there's a responsibility to do that. And then I hope down the road when we do emerge from this that, there, that we can still not have to live in fear. Like I, think, 
I think you're going to see a huge explosion in comedy. When, when Saturday Night Live first came on in 1975, that was an explosion in comedy in a way comparable to Elvis Presley playing the guitar back in 1955, 56. That pop, you know, prior to that, the most popular instrument in America was the piano, but Elvis Presley single-handedly revolutionized what kids wanted to learn how to play. And I think that this crisis is going to be a, a gigantic spike in comedy. The other night, Jane and I were looking for something on, I think, yeah, Netflix, like we'll watch something new. We had watched Breaking Bad and, and then we're watching Better Call Saul. What else do we watch, Jane? And uh, we watched the hairdressing one uh, anyway. And we thought, oh, somebody said, watch Ozark. Okay, so we watched Ozark about 20 minutes in. They're taking this guy, wrapping him up and putting him in a sealed container to torture and kill him. I said, we don't need this now. <laughs> we need we need Seinfeld, right? We we need funny stuff now. We need yes. funny stuff. I agree with you. When I watch TV or whatever I'm watching, I want to be entertained. And to me, entertaining is laughing. And I, I don't want to cry. I don't want to be like scared. I I just want to giggle. I want to feel good because there's enough to feel afraid of or worried about or whatever. Um, I want to I want to laugh. Well, and that's why I'm launching. The, that's why this show which is called Trapped Live with Bill Boggs every Friday to start with one, five o'clock every Friday. I'm going to have a comedian and we're going to talk to the comedian about his, his work, do some shtick, see a clip of his work, see a clip of his favorite comedian's work and wrap it up like in a half hour. And that's on Bill Boggs TV, five o'clock every Friday for that express purpose. I would not see... I wouldn't be doing that, and countless other people wouldn't be doing other things on the internet and elsewhere creatively if it wasn't for this crisis. Let's look at it this way. What else do we have to do? We're home. You know, <laughs> we're home. It's like, wait, wait, who is that? Rodney Danger? Hey, we're home. Look at my house. I got this thing behind me. What is it? I'm not sure. Nobody is. I miss Rodney. He was a, he was a classic character. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's just we'll say, you know, yeah, I want to wrap it up, but I, but before we go to the new generation, the new, the new things that are going to emerge out of this, what advice can you offer them? You want advice from Bill Boggs about what's going to emerge from this new thing? What, what advice do you have to them about following your goals, about, about chasing after your dreams? about trying oh. new things to get where you want to be, about using this new technology, about using the new, the new ways of doing things and going after what you believe that it is you're supposed to do from somebody who's been successful for a long time in doing it. What can yeah. you tell these kids? I would say um, one of the, the great moguls of, of Hollywood, Barry Diller, right, was talking to me back at the 2007-2008 huge recession you know which was terrible stock market down 30 percent he could he said you know it'd be really easy to sit here and complain about how bad my business is but let me just say this i learned this a long time ago from they mentioned some other hollywood mogul so i will say my answer to your question is two things one in difficult times the astute discern opportunity. I don't mean taking care of others. I don't mean taking advantage of others or hustling. In difficult times, the astute discern opportunity. And the I'm frequently asked, I am frequently asked this one question. You know, you've interviewed all these people. You know, what have you learned from them? So one trait that I think these well, hundreds and hundreds of highly successful people I've interviewed, writers, authors, politicians, movie stars, uh, business people, that, that these people had a faith in their God-given talent and that there was a force with them because that they believed that faith could see them through, whether times for them were good or times for them were bad, which leads me to 
something Frank Sinatra said to me. You're very powerful, provided you know how powerful you are. Digest that one. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. You know what? That's what that's what Jane does to me. Oh, oh my! Oh yeah! Every every I'll say, oh look! I'm, oh no! Oh, oh. Okay. Oh, listen. Thank you very much. One more final plug. Go to Amazon. The Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog, as told to your guest today, Go Boggs. Who knew that this little business card would end up being my lifeline to sell books? <laughs> and Bill Boggs TV. Check it out on YouTube. And thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bill, for being here and for watching the Funky Brain Podcast. Have a great day today, everybody. Wonderful. You're, you're, you're absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. <laughs>